Welcome back, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at module 20, um, looking at operating conditioning. So we talked about classical conditioning in the last one, as well as just kind of basic concepts of learning. Um, today, we're going to be we're focusing more on the operant side of things. So this is um, when things are reinforced after the act. Okay. So again, always, as always, you can find the PowerPoints on D2L, right where you found this video. Um, so you're not just looking it up randomly on YouTube. You can also find uh, the the module that we're going through in our book on page 243. Um, so if you want to follow along with the book, that's your choice too. Don't forget to do the two quizzes, including the quiz for this one where I give the random facts um, throughout. And I believe that's everything. So let's go ahead and get going looking at operant conditioning. Okay. So module 20, again, um, slide two, operant conditioning, part one. Um, operant conditioning is a type of learning in which behavior is strengthened if followed by a reinforcer or diminished if followed by a punisher. Um, I just have the image of like the punisher, the superhero guy coming in. But anyway, uh, maybe that'll make it stick better if you think of it this way. But the idea here is that it's basically the idea of like, you know, very good, you get a cookie, okay. Great paper, you got an A. Okay, that's that would be operant conditioning, where we, we, we are trained, essentially, to do certain actions to get certain rewards. So operant behavior is a behavior that operates on the environment to produce rewarding or punishing stimuli. Um, so we're either trying to produce something or avoid something, potentially. Okay. Uh, in contrast, classical conditioning involves respondent behavior, automatic responses to a stimulus, which we talked about in the last one, right? It's we we have no conscious thought about it. Operant behavior, to some extent, we will in fact have the ability to consciously choose an action. Okay, classical conditioning, you have no choice, right? If I've conditioned you classically and I ring that bell and you, it, it, that's what you're conditioned with, you're going to start salivating like Pavlov's dogs. Okay. Operant behaviors, you're going to have a knee-jerk reaction to some extent. But it's not, it's, it doesn't force you to do it the way that classical conditioning does. Okay. Um, all right. So next slide. Slide three, operant conditioning part two. Behavior operates on the environment to produce rewarding or punishing stimuli. We start to realize that there's certain things that are basically going to make you feel happier, right? So if I do this thing, I will get this thing, right? This is why we, why we, get a job at McDonald's or something like that, um, or Wendy's or whatever. We, that way we can we can get that paycheck at the end. We might not like care for the work, but we're willing to do it to get the, the final reward. Okay. Um, so we're looking for rewarding or punishing stimuli. Organisms associate their own actions with consequences. I do this, this happens. Okay. Actions followed by reinforcement increase. Those followed by punishment often decrease, though not guaranteed to. Okay. Um, so uh, a, a kind of random example would be like a thing like a rain dance. I do a certain thing, right? I do a certain movement or set of movements or whatever. Or I sing a certain song or things like this. And then I get the thing that I was striving for, rain in this case, uh, will happen afterwards. So let's say I do a dance and three days later, I get rain. I do a dance again, and three days later, I get rain. And I'm like, my brain starts making associations. And it's like, hey, when I do this thing, I get this reward. Therefore, this is what I should be doing. Okay. So organisms associate their own actions with consequences. Actions are followed by reinforcement, which increase, and then the ones that are followed by punishments decrease. And this is the idea also of like why we would um, you know, give, give rewards, like candy or things like that, for things we want to see our kids do. Um, and you might provide some kind of a punishment, like a timeout, uh, or for some people, spankings and things like that. Um, because that's the idea of, it would hopefully diminish the likelihood of that happening again. Okay. Same thing with pups, right? If you're training a dog, you tell them sit, and when they sit, you give them a treat, and you give them praise, uh, but you don't give them that until they actually do the action that you're wanting. Okay. All right, slide four, Skinner's Experiments, part one. So B.F. Skinner, 1904 to 1990, 
Uh, he's a modern behaviorism's most influential and controversial figure. He was weird. He had some strange, strange things. Um, he had some excellent things, but he had some some of his ideas. He, he, he had a tendency, a lot of behaviorists had a tendency of taking their ideas too far um, and, and pushing it a little further than it really than they had evidence for. He expanded on Edward L. Thorndike's law of effect, which states that rewarded behaviors tend to reoccur. I actually have a couple of videos um, connected to this. So if you look in our, in our content for this week, um, in the video section, you'll find uh, one video is, is uh, looking at operant conditioning specifically. Um, and that's looking at kind of Skinner's ideas of operant conditioning. The other is looking at the puzzle box by Thorndike. And so you can, you can actually get a, a look at both of these areas um, on those two videos. That'll give you an idea. There's also the, the crash course video is a really good one. It gives you a really quick overview of, of, of these also. So you might check, check that out as well. But anyway, so Thorndike came up with these, these boxes basically where he would have something like a latch or something and he would take cats. He discovered this with cats, puts them inside, and they would pop the latch, open the box, cat escapes, and he'd have like a little bowl of fish or something for them as a reward. Um, this is the law of effects. Basically, if, if the cat would do something and got rewarded for it, they would do it more quickly and more efficiently over time, showing learning, right? This operant conditioning is a form of learning in the process. So he developed behavioral technology, uh, Skinner developed behavioral technology that revealed principles of behavioral control. Um, so for him, he, he developed what he called the operant chamber, or it's also been nicknamed the Skinner box. Um, it, was, it was built off of the ideas of Thorndike uh, as far as having that, that principle of, of a box that they did something in to get a, a, a reward in some way, shape, or form. Um, but in his box, in Skinner's box, he had uh, not just a latch to get out, but he included a little bar, a little lever that an animal pressed. It could also be a button or a key or different things like that. Um, depending on the creator to figure out what would work best. Uh, yet in some cases, he even had like multiple levers or multiple points of contact. Uh, but in, in, in doing that, they would release a reward such as food or water, as well as a device that records these responses. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we'll keep going with this. So Skinner's experiments, time required to escape in seconds. This was This is actually one of Thorndike's picture or an image of Thorndike's thing. So if you look on page 244, you can see the same image that we're seeing on the PowerPoint. Um, it shows a little cat in a box and a little graph. Over time, basically Thorndike discovered that it took less and less time to uh, to escape the box with ex with experience, essentially. And we, they found the same thing with rats running mazes, right? It, with, ex with, with experience in a given maze, the rats become more efficient, typically. Um, especially if there's a reward at the end, they'll get faster and faster and faster in their exploration, um, trying to get to that reward as quickly as possible. Okay, so that's Thorndike. Next slide, slide six, Skinner's Experiments, part three. Um, this is an example, and you can find the same image on page 244 again, same page as you found the Thorndike box. Uh, uh, it shows a little rat inside a, a, a little chamber. So by shaping animals' natural behaviors, Skinner was able to teach these animals unnatural behaviors, such as teaching pigeons to walk in a figure eight, play ping pong, keep a missile on, on course by pecking at a screen target. So he had simple computer sets up, setups, and they would just keep pecking at a certain point until the missile hit, at which point, if they hit the target, they got food. Okay. Uh, reinforcement was any event that strengthens the behavior it follows. And that was the key, right? So that could be a reward, or it could be a reduction in a discomfort. So if it's a reward, it could be like, and that, both those actually technically would be a reward. One would be like a, a physical like you know benefit, something that makes you better, makes you happy. The other could be something that you are reducing something that is causing negative effects. Okay, we'll dig into that more in just a second. Um, so slide seven, shaping behavior. Everyday behaviors are continually reinforced and shaped. Everything you do to some extent is shaping you into the person that you are, right? We talked about this with the basic learning, the classical conditioning to some extent, but with, in this case, um, every action that you do is gonna have either a positive or negative effect for the most part, right? There might be some actions that have no effect. For example, I just reached for this glass because I'm feeling thirsty, right? But my, my conditioning, my, I've been operatively conditioned to reach for a cup when I get thirsty. 
because I know the reward of water lies there within. Okay. So every day is, everyday behaviors are continually reinforced and shaped. Uh, shaping is gradually guiding behavior toward closer and closer approximations of the desired behavior. With the method of successive approximations, responses that are increasingly closer to the final desired behavior are rewarded. All other responses are ignored. And this works if you're working with animals. So I trained horses in the past as well as dogs. Um, it works with both of them really well. You can technically do this with chickens and things. My, uh, my sister had a, a chicken that she did some experiments with with this. Um, I mean, if you can do it with a pigeon, you can do it with a chicken. But anyway, uh, it, it works. It also works with kids. It also works with yourself. And so this is something that you can actually take away uh, and, and, and utilize these methods to, to improve yourself as well as, as your practices and things. All right. First random fact. Here we go. Uh, before finally being accepted, J.K. Rowling's original Harry Potter pitch was rejected by 12 different publishers. I bet they're kicking themselves now considering that her works are the number one selling work of all time except for the Quran and the Bible. The Bible outdid everything. But um, So yeah, there you go, J.K. Rowling. Uh, okay, next slide, slide eight. Operant conditioning types of reinforcers. So we have positive reinforcement, increases behaviors by presenting positive reinforcers. Very good, you get a cookie. Okay, that kind of thinking. So positive reinforcer is any stimulus that when presented after response, strengthens the response. You do this job, you get a paycheck. You do this activity, you get a candy, right? Like if you're potty training a kiddo, like M&Ms or things like that, whatever their little favorite thing is, um, could be that positive reinforcer, okay? This could also be for you. Let's say you're trying to get into a good habit of, of studying and things like that. You can give yourself a small reward at the end of a certain amount of time or a, a certain number of pages or whatever that you're trying to study for. Um, you reward yourself with a given thing. It could be a favorite song, it could be whatever. Um, but something that you see as positive will reinforce your likelihood of wanting to do that activity more often. Okay. Negative reinforcement increases behaviors by stopping or reducing negative stimuli. Um, so negative reinforcement is any stimulus that when removed after a response strengthens the response. Not that it is not, note that it is not punishment. Okay. So negative reinforcement is essentially you are reducing a certain thing that is causing discomfort to some extent. At the end of a big meal, you might unbuckle your belt. Basically, that would be a negative reinforcement. You are reducing the discomfort um, that, that eating that giant meal did, right? And so that might be a new habit that you develop. Um, this is also where the, the tendency to getting addicted to like painkillers and things can occur. Um, you, you, you quickly learn that, that when you take that pill, it reduces a chronic pain that it, you don't want. And you are basically, so not only do you have the, the potential chemical uh, effects of the, of the you know, whatever the painkiller might be, but then you also have this conditioning aspect where you take this pill and you get rewarded by removing the pain that you've been experiencing. Okay. All right, so nine ways to increase, slide nine, ways to increase behavior. So operant conditioning terms, you have positive reinforcement, which is where you add a desirable stimulus. Very good, you get a cookie kind of thing. Okay, pet a dog that comes when you call it and they want to come when you call it. Um, if I smack the dog every time, I'm like, come here, boy, whack. Okay, that dog wouldn't come pretty quickly. Like they'd be like, nope, okay. Um, they would they would learn to, to associate my calling them with getting smacked, so don't do that, right? Um, pay someone for work done, right? Come to work regularly and you get paid this paycheck at the end of the week. That's what keeps you going. It's their external uh, external motivators. So negative reinforcement removes an aversive stimulus such as taking painkillers to end pain or fastening the seatbelt to end that loud beeping, right? The, the, you're, you're, they're making it more and more annoying too. Since the newer the cars are, the more obnoxious the sound is, which is utilizing this idea to try to get people to wear the seatbelts. Okay or cheat and like buckle it when you're not in it, whatever. But anyway, um, the point to remember in all this though is, is that uh, either in either case, these are rewards, okay? So we're either providing something desirable or removing something that is aversive, something that we don't enjoy. So that, that is a reinforcement, okay? It strengthens the behavior in both cases, okay? Pause there. Random fact number two. Garlic is known to attract leeches. 
So if you are not wanting leeches to get all of you, do not wear garlic cologne when you go swimming. Okay. Um, slide 10. You. Okay. Operating conditioning. Types of reinforcers. Um, primary and condition. What, uh, random fact also. I was just thinking about that. It's weird that leeches are kind of like vampire bugs. And so if garlic uh, draws them, it's the flip-flop of what vampires do. But anyway. Okay. Totally random. Operating conditioning. Types of reinforcers. Disc, or slide 10. Disc 10. Don't ask me where that came from. Anyway. Primary and conditioned reinforcers. Um, so primary reinforcer is an unlearned, innately reinforcing stimulus, such as one that satisfies biological needs. You feel hunger, you seek out food. You feel thirst, you seek out water, okay, or lemonade or whatever. Um, it's unconditioned. It's just we, 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 we have a direct association basically from birth. This thing is causing me discomfort. I need the natural biological thing that, I, that would basically remove that discomfort, okay. Condition is secondary. It's a stimulus that gains power through association with primary reinforcers. Um, so we are we are generally conditioned to go to the refrigerator when we begin to feel hungry, because in our experience, generally speaking, at least in most, for most people, when you open that refrigerator door, there's something in there that can take care of that hunger. Okay. Um, and in some cases, you might even go to the refrigerator when you're bored because you've learned that food is a way of dealing with boredom. Okay, those are those are things to be aware of on the psychological things. That can be that conditioning. Okay. <coughs> um, immediate and delayed reinforcers. So immediate occurs immediately after behavior. You tell a dog to sit. As soon as they sit, they get the treat and the praise, and they're like, yay, I like this. Okay, that's an immediate uh, reinforcer. Delayed re reinforcer is involves a time delay between the desired response and the delivery of the reward. Your paycheck at the end of the week is a delayed reinforcer, right? It's an expectation of when it's going to come. Um, the more intelligent the creature, the longer the delay can be. But even for us, which is basically as far as you know, the most advanced creature on the planet, right? Um, it only works so far. If it's too far out there, uh, the, the reinforcer won't work as a reinforcer. We, we, we disassociate them from each other. Typically, the faster the thing occurs, the faster we, we, we develop the, the idea of the association. Okay. So if you do something good and I give you an immediate reward, uh, you're more likely to, to continue to do that thing. This is actually how games work. So video games, if, you've played, if, you're, if you're any kind of a gamer, whether that be like console slash you know desktop kind of like games where you're actually working in, in computers and things or like on your phone the little cheesy like candy crush type games um, immediate rewards if you look at most games they're going to start really easy and you're going to get rewards left and right everything you do is like it, it throws rewards at you okay over time though the rewards begin to get harder and harder and harder to achieve it takes longer and longer and longer to get them but the rewards get bigger and bigger and bigger along with that okay so uh, one of my favorite games previously, I don't play games hardly anymore at all, but when I was younger, I used to play Skyrim a lot, right? The first stages, you're like, everything was you're like, hey, you got a reward. You, you know, you picked a face. Excellent. You kind of a thing as you're creating your character and all these things. The deeper you got into the game, though, which I spent way too many hours doing, but the deeper you got into the game, um, the, the quests got more and more challenging. They got longer and longer, but the rewards were bigger and bigger. They got stronger armor, stronger weapons, and all those kinds of things. Um, but it took forever to achieve some of them, not literally, but some of them took literally hours to achieve some of the, the some of the rewards, right, to get to that reward. Um, but that 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 is actually intentional because by, by, by progressing in the time um, and progressing in the difficulty, it sucks you into the game and keeps you there. Candy Crush and those kinds of kind of lame old games do the same thing, right? When you first start playing, every level is just like, bam, I'm just blowing through this game like nothing. And all of a sudden, you had a point where you're like, oh, this is a little bit more challenging. And the first you get to a point where like, I can't beat this stupid game. Okay. Um, that progression, you keep playing though because you want that next reward. I want those three golden stars or whatever it is that it's going to give me if I do it right, right? Uh, Angry Birds, all those kinds of games built are built on that idea. Um until you finally beat the game, and then you, but that by that point you might have actually developed essentially a, a form of um, addiction, basically, to that experience of that reward. You have been. It's not. A, it's not a, an addiction in the way like a drug is, where it doesn't necessarily affect the brain in that way. But you have been deeply conditioned 
to want to play that game to get that reward. Okay. That was a little bit of a rant, but hopefully that makes sense. Uh, but that's that's but this idea of conditioning. Uh, those are all secondary conditioning, right? Like it's not just it's not a natural desire necessarily. We are conditioned through it. Our brain doesn't know the difference between fake gold and real gold, real fake armor, and real armor, right? It's just like you got this thing. That's amazing. And that's a great thing. So keep going. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Slide eleven. Reinforcement schedule part one. Um, so reinforcement schedule is a pattern that defines how often a desired response will be reinforced. Is it, it do you get reinforced every single time? You know, like I tell a pup sit, and every single time they sit, they get a reward. Okay, um, that's that's going to be that potential concept. Or is it like every third time? Or is it at random increments? Okay, um, is it on a time schedule, or is it on a on a case by case scenario? Like, do I get paid by the hour, or do I get paid by each product made? Okay. Uh, different ways are going to actually encourage different amounts of, of participation. So continuous reinforcement schedule, reinforcing the desired response every time it occurs. So it, it basically is what it sounds like. It's continuous. Every time that the thing happens, you get you get it reinforced. It gets rewarded. Um, partial or intermittent reinforcement schedule is reinforcing a response only part of the time. It results in slower acquisition of a response, but much greater resistance to extinction then does continuous reinforcement. I'm gonna talk about that more in depth here in just a second. We've got a slide coming up that has some images that will be useful. Um, okay, slide 12, reinforcement schedules part two. Fixed ratio schedule is a reinforcement, reinforcing response only after a specified number of responses. Um, every fifth time you do it, you get rewarded. Every 10th coffee you buy at the coffee shop, they give you a free coffee. Okay, that's a fixed ratio schedule. Works pretty well. Variable ratio schedule, reinforcing a response after an unpredictable number of responses. I'm gonna look at that in a second. Fixed interval schedule, reinforcing a response only after a specified time has elapsed. Every 24 hours you get this thing, okay, or whatever. Uh, variable interval schedule is reinforcing a response at unpredictable time intervals. You don't know when, you don't know why, it just randomly is there. Okay, slide 13, and you can find this image. This is a, this is a little graph that you can also find on page 248, um, intermittent reinforcement schedules. So the fixed ratio where it's, it's you know, this is just however many times you do it, you get a reward. Uh, that one will develop the, 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 the number of responses basically and the time that it takes to get conditioned is very fast. Okay. Um, this is this was actually an experiment that, that uh, Skinner did, and you, you find gives you some more information there. So Skinner's 1961 laboratory pigeons produced a, uh, four reinforcement schedules. Is what he found worked with them. So the reinforcers are indicated by the diagonal marks, the little dashes. Okay. Um, for people, as for pigeons, reinforcement linked to number of responses, a ratio schedule um, produced a higher re uh, response rate than reinforcement linked. To amount of time, so we are generally we are going to have a much stronger connection to um, per item or per action than we are just at you know at set times along the way. If it's like every 15 minutes you get a, you get a reward, that that is actually really hard to associate with the actions that you're doing. On the other hand, if it's like every 100 times I do this or every 20 times I do this, I get a reward. Every 10 right copies I buy, I get a free one. Um, that would cause you to keep coming back much faster. The, the best one or the strongest one um, is actually the variable ratio. Okay, so if I wanna get a fast response, I reward it every time, or I reward it at a, very, at a fixed set of, of times, right? Every third time, you get a reward. Every 20th time, you get a reward or whatever. If I, that's the fastest way to develop conditioning. But it also goes extinct relatively quickly. Like if, if it's every five times you get a reward and I do it five times and I don't get a reward and I do it one or two more times and I still don't get a reward uh, and I know it's supposed to be every five times, I give up very fast. I'm like, eh, this must be broken and I, I stop doing it. Okay. Uh, variable ratio is going to be where maybe it might be every second time, it might be every time, it might be every tenth time. And I don't know how many times it's going to take, but I know eventually I will get a reward. It takes a little longer to condition someone with that, but 
it, the conditioning once it has occurred remains stronger for much longer. Okay. Um, so in this case, uh, you might be able to think of something, right? Like, like think of something that where, where this could be played out in real life, the variable ratio. What's an activity that a lot of people actually end up becoming addicted to, um, to the point where they actually have to receive counseling and things in, in many cases to get out of it, uh, where it might be a random number of times that they do it and they get rewarded. Okay, I'll give you a hint. It oftentimes involves, it used to involve this. Now it involves pushing a button. Okay. Um, Maybe, okay, here we go. Like, gambling. Gambling is a, there's a variable ratio, right? Um, slot machines are, 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 are basically just a, a, a Skinner box created for humans. I, I'll pull this stupid lever over and over and over again, and I'll keep plunking my pennies or dimes or quarters in or whatever. Um, because event, sometimes when I do it, I get a reward. And I don't know how many times it's going to take, but eventually this stupid machine is going to pay me something. Okay. Um, and they're actually designed in a way where they're going to kick you out small rewards every now and then to keep you there, right? Oh, man, I got $10. You know, you might have just put $15 in, but who cares? I got $10. Woo! You know, keep on playing. And, and you know, next time might be the jackpot. I might get that $10,000 payout. They, those machines are built in a way that they will they will take in more money than they will ever put out, right? It takes Like once they make $12,000 on it, they'll pay out $10,000 kind of a thing. Um but if you're the lucky guy who puts the quarter in randomly and pulls it, and it happens to be at that point when they give you the ten thousand, then you know you, you got lucky on that one. But there, but you will. So many people will just sit there and do it. I've I've only gone to Vegas a couple of times. And I remember one of the times I went in and I was watching these. I, you know, psychology, right? I, I I don't really enjoy gambling. In fact, I I really uh, I hate gambling just because I I am extremely unlucky when it comes to when it, when I actually put money on the table. I just fail. But uh, so I sit and watch people, you know, I'll sit and drink a glass of scotch and watch people instead of gambling. Um, and what I, what I would observed was you'd have people like they have, they would basically reserve like five, six, seven slot machines and they'd be walking along just, just putting coins in and, and pulling these or pushing the button to make it go. And they just keep going around and around and around and around and around in the hopes that one of these machines is going to pay out. Um, and in their mind, they're up. They're upping their odds. When in fact, what they're doing is they're, they're increasing. They, to some extent, they are up in the odds, right? They have a seven to whatever odds. But they've increased the number of, of times that it's not going to get by seven as well. So if it was like a thousand to one, now it's seven thousand to seven, which is still a thousand to one odds, right? And with those things, oftentimes it's much more than a thousand to one odds. It's much worse. Um, but you keep coming back. Because you've been rewarded sometimes, and, it has, and there's that chance that you could be that lucky time that you're getting that big payout, right? Um, and thus, you get addicted to these things. You are conditioned to continue to do so because of that. You're, that there's a there's a positive reinforcer, basically, of getting that potential payout that keeps you coming back. Okay, it wouldn't work as well if you knew that every 15 minutes the, the machine was going to pay you out. Uh, essentially, if it, if you knew it was a timer. You'd pull the lever and then you'd like set your timer and walk away and then come back in 15 minutes and then pull it again once, get your pay out, walk away. 15 minutes later, you come back, pull it again, right? It, it's very hard to condition someone um, using that timer like that. You might condition them to, to check it at those given times, but they're, they're, they're not going to just sit there and just keep pulling it over and over and over again um, and, and keep putting their money in. Okay. 14. Uh, reinforcement schedules part three. So a fixed ratio is every so many reinforcement after every whatever behavior, such as buy 10 copies, get one free, or pay workers per product unit produced, which they've actually found is, is you get a much faster production rate. So if, if I, let's say I'm having you work at a factory, okay, or I'm having you work at a, on a production line or something, and I want uh, I'm wanting you to produce a certain thing. You're, 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 you're selling me your craft, your ability to create these things uh, for the thing that I'm getting from you, right? Uh, if I pay you by the hour, I generally won't get as many products from you per hour as if I paid you per product. Uh, interestingly, let's say, I, let's say I give you like $20 an hour, okay? Um, if I told you on the other hand, like let's say on, on average it can take you uh, takes you a minute 
if you're really pushing yourself, you can get a product done per minute, one per minute. Uh, and I tell you, I'll give you 50 cents per item. Okay. Um, it will generally, they will, in, you will increase your, the likelihood is that you'll increase the rate of production, um, which technically gets you more money, right? Uh, you end up with, if you, if you actually went on like full throttle, you could get like 30 bucks an hour. If it's 50 cents per item and you could get one per minute, right? Um, but in the long run, I'd end up with a lot more products to turn around and sell. So let's say like I turn around and sell it for a dollar a piece. If I was paying you $20 an hour and you were only producing like 10, you're just kind of taking your time dawdling because it doesn't matter how many you produce. It just matters that you're there for that set of time. Um, you're going to produce a lot less than if I were, than if you were just, if, if it's by how many you produce. Okay. Um, so that can be a, something to think, keep in mind if you get into the business. Okay. Variable ratio is after an unpredictable number. So reinforcement after a random number of behaviors as when playing a slot machine or fly fishing, right? I am a fly fisherman. I love fly fishing. I love fishing in general. Um, you stand out there and wave a stick most of the time doing nothing, right? You look like a dork. If you actually really think about it, you're like, I'm just whipping the water. Uh, but every now and then a fish comes along and gets it. And if I really know what I'm doing, I can do, I can get it to happen more often than not. Uh, and if it's a good day and you know, all the variables are hitting all that kind of stuff, but it, it, that, that thrill of the unknown is what pulls you back into it. Same with gambling. I don't know why I don't like gambling, but I like fishing. Who knows? But, um, works on the same principles there. Right. If I took you out fishing, like I say, you're never going fishing. I take you out fishing, and the first ten times we go fishing, you don't catch a single thing. There's a good chance you're not like you're gonna not like being a fisherman, right? You're like this is a stupid sport. I'm literally just standing here slapping the water with a string. Um, but if the first time you went out, you caught a fish, and you got that thrill of it, there's a good chance that you would be hooked at that moment. Okay. That's a, if if you have kiddos and if you are a fisherman and you want your kids to fish, do your very best to make sure that they can get a fish one of the first times that they go. And they'll learn to love it from that. Okay. Uh, interval. Fixed intervals are going to be every so often, right? Reinforcement for behavior after a fixed time, such as Tuesday discount prices. If everyone goes to get on Tuesdays, like movie theaters and stuff. You know, it's like $5 Tuesdays or whatever. It might be more than that. I haven't gone to the theater forever. But anyway, um, they had $5 Tuesdays when I was younger versus the $7 or $8 that cost at any other time. Um, which probably shows I haven't been to the theater for a very long time. It's probably much more than that now. But uh, with that, there was so many people that went on Tuesdays because of that discount, right? Um, or it could be like, if you go on this day, not only, you know, it, it costs the normal price, but you get a free piece of junk, you know, whatever. But they, they were like, free stuff, I want to do that. And so it encouraged you to go on that day. Um, it's a fixed interval, right? On this day or at this time, you get this reward uh, for, for participating in this thing. Um, variable interval is going to be unpredictably often reinforcement for behavior after a random amount of time as when checking our phone for a message, right? You just keep, if, if I've texted somebody and I'm waiting for them to text me back, I'll just randomly be picking up my phone because at some point, who knows when exactly I'm going to get my response. Um, it can work, right? There's a, people are addicted to our phones to be cut with that kind of thing. Um, but there's the, the variable ratio is going to be much more like, like how Facebook works, right? Or Instagram. You're, you're checking to see how, like, how, uh, when it was that somebody checks in or whatever. It's kind of a mixture of a variable interval and a variable ratio. Gets you hooked. Okay. All right. 15, punishment. Part one. Before we go into that, though, let's give you the third random fact. Takes uh takes Uranus 84 years to orbit the sun once, 84 Earth years, which is one Ura Uranian year. Anyway, um, yeah, 84 years, Earth years to get around the sun for Uranus. There are a lot of jokes that suddenly came to my mind when my little 12-year-old hit, but um, anyway, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> Slide 15, punishment, part one. Okay, punishment administrators. <laughs> An undesirable consequence. So this is not a reward, and it's not a removal of, of harm. Punishment is an, an increase of discomfort in some way, shape, or form, right? An undesirable consequence or withdraws something desirable in an attempt to decrease the frequency of a behavior, such as a child's disobedience. Okay, so positive punishment doesn't mean it's like, yay, I'm getting punished. Positive punishment means I'm adding something, right? Presenting the negative consequence after an undesired behavior is exhibited 
making that behavior less likely to happen in the future. A timeout is a positive punishment. A spanking is a positive punishment because I'm adding something negative that wasn't there before. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's essentially what that is. Negative punishment is gonna be removing a desired stimulus, getting grounded, uh, getting your your rights to TV or something like that removed for a time because you broke you, you broke the rules. Um, that's a negative punishment. You're you're getting something removed from you that you see as a positive. Okay. So after particular undesired behavior is exhibited, resulting in reducing that behavior in the future. Right. That's the thinking. If you if you if I don't want you to do this, I either will do something that makes you uncomfortable, or I will do I will take something from you that you enjoy. And that basically is is the idea of what a punishment is. So slide 16, um, you can actually find this information also on page 249, uh, but we have ratio, a fixed ratio is every so many, so reinforcement, oh wait, that's, a, that's the wrong thing. Um, just actually look at page 249, I'm not sure why they, we have the wrong information on here. But anyway, if you look at page 249, um, so you have the type of punisher, is a positive, if it's a positive punishment, the description is administer an adversive stimulus. Example would be like spraying water on a barking dog or giving a traffic ticket for speeding, right? Those are, that would be um, examples of a positive punishment. Negative punishment would be withdrawing rewarding stimulus, such as taking away a misbehaving teen's driving privileges or revoke a ro rude person's chat room access, those kinds of things, if chat rooms are even a thing anymore. Again, old school, but anyway, um, keep on rolling. Slide 17. Four major drawbacks of physical punishment. Um, so the punished behavior is suppressed, but not forgotten. Okay, so the temporary state may negatively reinforce uh, parents' punishing behavior. Um, so things like spanking, for example. Okay, when, when, if you if you really if you want to take like like look at like how we develop and how these things work, we we go really in deep on this in human growth and development. So if you take like Psych two thirty five. Um, We'll, we'll dive into this, this idea of looking at spanking and the like. But uh, spanking has been proven in the most cases not to work, basically. Um, and generally, the reason why spanking happens and continues to happen is because it actually is it's emotionally rewarding to the parent. It gives the parent the feeling that they're accomplishing something, and it also gives them an outlet for generally the feelings of frustration at the negative behavior that the child is exhibiting. Uh, is producing in them. In other words, I get annoyed at the kid because they're doing something stupid, so I spank him because it makes me feel better. Okay, that's not a good thing. I'm essentially reinforcing the, the spanking tendency in the parent because it makes you feel better, while at the same time not actually doing that much good for the child. So generally speaking, I would say avoid spanking. Take Psych 235. I, I think there are some, some um, areas where that if spanking might be allowable. But if you want to look at that, look at look at Psych 235. But anyway, um, so punishment teaches discrimination among situations, perhaps only selectively decreasing the undesired behavior. Punishment can teach fear, right? We learn to fear the actions rather than uh, doing it because we, we learn that it's the wrong thing to do. Physical punishment may increase aggression by modeling violence as a way to cope with problems. So if you look at like Bandura, right, the social behavioral learning uh, theory, uh, he really showed this, this idea of, of, in the Bobo doll experiment, which I think we'll look at actually in the next module. Let me look forward, what's the next module? Yes, biology, cognition, and learning. Uh, we'll look at Bandura, so, so we'll talk about that then, the Bobo doll experiment things. So there's some videos on that, if you wanna get ahead, you can look at those, but anyway. Um, what they found basically is that you, you, you are essentially taught to avoid punishment if you get spanked, for example. So if, if, if I cause physical discomfort to you because you're doing something I don't like, what you learn, you get really good at is, is basically oftentimes you don't, you don't necessarily stop doing the action. You get good at not getting caught doing the action, right? My friend, I had a friend growing up that he got spanked pretty much every day of his life when he was a little kid, like literally, that was just his parents' go-to. And he was the friend that I, I got in more trouble with him uh, in middle school and high school than pretty much any of my other friends because he got really, really, we actually didn't get in trouble. We did things we should have gotten in trouble for, but we didn't get caught because he was really good at doing really bad things and not getting caught doing them, right? Nothing illegal necessarily, but at the same time, it was stuff that we, it was not good actions, right? Like I, if, if I was the parent and I knew my kids were doing it, I, I, they would be in trouble. 
doing it. Um, but that, that's, that's a tendency. There's a strong tendency with physical punishment um, for that to be the case, where the, the child learns to become tricky in their deviance rather than just avoiding the deviance altogether. Okay. Slide 18, applications of operant conditioning at school. So electronic technologies and adaptive learning software used in teaching and learning have helped realize Skinner's goal of individually paced, customized instruction with immediate feedback, right? Um, if you can gamify a thing, it'll make it much easier to learn. Like if you, if you use the same kind of thing, that's essentially, video games are just giant Skinner boxes. They're, they're, they have mastered the skill of pulling you in and keeping you there through conditioning, um, through like, you know, fake rewards essentially. Uh, if you can do the same thing with your schoolwork, you will, you will, you'll get addicted to learning, essentially addicted to the process of school. Um, in sports, behavioral methods are used to shape behavior and athletic performance, right? If I can, if I can learn to reward the things that I want to see and possibly, uh, uh, you know, block or, 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 or punish the things that I don't want to see in some way, shape or form, um, it, your, your abilities in sports will increase dramatically. At work, rewards have been successfully used to increase productivity and skill development. Um, if I give you, interestingly enough, money actually isn't as big a motivator as people think it is. Um, oftentimes, if I can give you time, that's a much bigger motivator for most people. So if you're like, I'm like, if you go through this training, you get an extra day off or something like that. Um, then, or when you're done with it, you get the rest of the day off from that point forward. They found that people are much more likely to take that kind of reward and as, as incentive to do the thing. Okay. Uh, at home, basic rules of shaping are used in parenting and to reinforce our own desired behaviors. We can essentially become our own parent if we're trying to, to develop new skills and or new habits. Um, so if, if this is your first semester as a student, you can intentionally set up an environment where you will get rewarded for the activities and things that you do and get punished if you do things that you shouldn't be doing, right? Uh, so it could be like maybe maybe you are like into social media stuff, right? Instagram and junk. Uh, so you're like, I, I, I can't look at these things at all until I do at least 30 minutes of homework. Once you do 30 minutes of homework, I would recommend setting a timer, right? Like you can look at like 15 minutes at whatever it is you want to look at. Um, or if you like surfing the internet or watching YouTube or whatever, right? Uh, you can like watch a video after a certain amount of time of, of studying. Okay. That'd be an example of how you could potentially use this to reward yourself. Another example of this, I, I heard one guy give an example where he... Um, was trying to learn how to, or trying to make himself floss his teeth. He hated flossing his teeth. Every time he went to the dentist, the dentist was like, do you floss? And he's like, you know, as his gums are bleeding, he's like, you know, no, I don't. Um, so he wanted to get to where he could actually do it, but he still hated it. Um, what you do, if you're trying to actually set up a reward system, think of how the games work, right? Make the first task super easy. And so what he did as he did, if he flossed one tooth, he would get his reward. In his case, his reward was singing his favorite song. Who knows? That could be your thing too, right? It could be singing a song. It could be a, a you get a you get a treat like a food kind of treat. It could be you get to go do something you want to do. It could be you know you get to listen to a podcast or watch a YouTube video or whatever, right? You get rewarded for it after a very easy thing to do. And what he found is that after flossing just one tooth, he got his reward. But because he was already doing it, he might as well just go ahead and keep on going. He would end up flossing all of his teeth, typically. But the reward came after just flossing one tooth. Uh, and that's that's actually one of the tricks that you can utilize in, in, in reinforcing. You make, the, you make the first task easy, but it naturally leads into continuing on with the rest. Okay. Set up a reward system for yourself. And or a punishment system to some extent, right? Until I do this thing, I cannot do this thing that I want to do would be another thing that could potentially help. 19, reinforcing desired behaviors and extinguishing undesired behaviors. So uh, state a realistic goal in measurable terms. So this is kind of what I'm looking at, right? You're going to floss a tooth. You're going to sit down for 15 minutes and, and read the textbook. You're going to watch one of these lectures, right? Whatever the thing might be. Um, set something that is doable. Okay. So it's not gonna be like, I'm gonna make a million dollars by tomorrow, right? Like it might be doable for some people, but most people that's not realistic. Uh, decide how, when, and where you will work towards your goal. Make it concrete, right? From this time to this time, I'm gonna work on this thing. Or, or in, in this situation, you know, when I first get up in the morning, this is what I'm gonna do first thing, um, whatever it might be. Then monitor how often you engage in your desired behavior. 
reinforce the desired behavior, right? You, you reward yourself when you do what you want to do and reduce the rewards gradually. So initially it could be like every 10 minutes I get a chocolate every time that I'm working on this thing, right? Then it turns in every 20 minutes and then every 30 minutes, and then once an hour. Um, it's, you know, you're slowly reducing the amount of reward and eventually the thing itself, you are, you are habituated to do it. It becomes a habit and you no longer have to think about it. And so the reward no longer is necessary to keep you going. Okay. Now, if you totally have no rewards whatsoever and the thing itself is not a fun thing to do, eventually you'll kind of, you'll get unconditioned and you'll stop doing it. Um, but again, if you kind of think of video games, right? Think of that, you, you start off with a lot of rewards and the rewards become less and less often. You do the same thing with yourself and eventually you'll just have, you know, the thing itself will become the, the reward to some extent. Okay, let's see, slide 20. Before we get into slide 20, I'm gonna give you the final random fact. There are over 6,000 species of grass. There you go. Who knew that grass was so complicated? Okay, 6,000 species, um, including bamboo. But anyway, con contrasting classical and operant conditioning. Um, you can find this on, on page, boom, boom, boom. I just saw it. I think I saw it. No, I didn't. Um, actually, I, I did. I think it's on page two fifty two. There's a little paragraph talking about this, but this is a, this graph um, is not present. Oh, I take the back. It is on page two fifty two. It's there at the bottom. It just looks different than it looks on the PowerPoint. Um, so, table twenty point four in the book. Uh, so, classical conditioning versus operant conditioning. The basic idea of classical conditioning is learning associations between events we do not control. Right. A bell ringing, the stimulus of a bell ringing, and our reaction of salivation. Not salvation, but salivation. We start to salivate. Um, we, we have no control over it. Once we are classically conditioned, it just happens until it eventually disassociates with the given stimulus. Um, operant conditioning is learning associations between our behavior and its consequences. So this one we actually have more control of, right? Um, it'll be with 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 repeated times, we become more likely to do it unconsciously or without necessarily like really thinking it through. But, and that's where habits are formed. Um, but it, it does take some level of conscious thought for it to occur. Response, classical conditioning, involuntary and automatic. With operant conditioning, it's voluntary, right? Make, uh, you, you could be conditioned to where when a certain thing happens, you have a response to it because of the expected reward. But I still I have some say in whether or not I actually do it, right? It operates on environment. Acquisition, classical conditioning. You have the association events of the, the the neutral stimulus is paired with the unconditioned stimulus and becomes the conditioned stimulus, right? You have the 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 food which causes you to to salivate, with paired with the unconditioned stimulus, which is the bell ringing, which becomes the conditioned stimulus. In other words, when I hear the bell ringing, my brain associates the reaction that I had to the neutral stimulus of the food. Okay. Association. Associating is a response with operant conditioning. Associating is a response with consequence. It's a reinforcer or punisher. Uh, extinction. Condition response decreases when conditioned stimulus is repeatedly presented alone. If I keep ringing the bell and there's no food present, I, don't, I stop salivating. Uh, operant conditioning. Responding decreases when reinforcement stops. Right. If I keep pulling the lever and nothing happens for over and over and over and over and over again, eventually I'm going to stop pulling the lever. Okay. Um, so yeah. Spontaneous recovery, classical conditioning, the reappearance after a rest period of an ex extinguished or extinct uh, conditioned response. Right. Suddenly the bell rings and for some reason you start salivating even though you stopped it for a while. Um, with opera conditioning, it's the reappearance after a rest period of an extinguished response. Very similar. Okay. In this case, though, you, 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 know, you react to it. Generalization, classical conditioning, the tendency to respond to stimuli similar to, uh, to the, the conditioned stimulus. Um, so picture of a dog makes you do this thing. Picture of a bear, if it's generalized, it'll also make you do the same thing. Bell rings, it makes you do a thing. Similar sounding bell or a bell that sounds just kind of sort of like, makes you respond rather than a specific thing. Um, with an opera conditioning, as responses are learned in our in one situation occurring in others, similar situations, right? You're like, well, this usually gives me what I want. I don't. It, 
this seems like a similar type of thing, so therefore I'll, I'll try doing it this way and see what happens. Um, discrimination, classical conditioning. This, uh, so for example, if you think about games with, with the, the generalization, once you learn how games work generally, that thinking is actually transported into all the different games. There is some general psychology that pretty much all video games are gonna do, rely upon. Um, if it's your very first time playing a video game, you're actually gonna struggle with it significantly more because you don't have that foundation of conditioned, expected responses, right? Your little character comes up to a cliff, you generally are gonna to try to figure out how to jump to get over the cliff, unless you haven't been trained. If you don't have that training, you're just gonna drop and oops, you know, then you, then that's the beginning of the conditioning. You get, you get punished for falling into the hole kind of thing, right? Okay, um, discrimination, class conditioning, learning to distinguish between the conditioned stimulus and other stimuli that do not signal an unconditioned stimulus. You learn to, to like that specific bell or the specific picture is what you respond to and nothing else. Um, with operating conditioning, it's learning that some responses, but not others, will be reinforced. Sometimes this thing will give me something, but this thing over, I, I might as well just avoid doing this, right? Like this lever will give me food, but this lever won't. So why even touch that lever? I'm, I, want, I want the food. Okay. Um, they actually did a thing where they hooked up uh, rats. Uh, they took up several male rats. They hooked up their genitals where one lever caused them to have essentially an orgasm while the other lever gave them food. Um, when the rats figured that out, they sat there and hit the lever that caused the orgasm until they starved to death. Uh, these rats would literally die of pleasure essentially because they, it, would, it would give them that same brain stimulation as an orgasm would. Um, so yeah. Treat conditioning with care. Anyway, on that note, that is basically the, the module in a, in a kind of wrapped up. So, so make sure you read through it. Don't forget to do the quizzes. Um, message me if you have any questions. And beyond that, good luck. And I will see you all in the next one. The next, the next video, uh, we're going to be looking at biology, cognition, and learning in module 21. Um, so kind of the, the little deeper dive into the more complex sides of how we learn. Until then, have a great one, and I will see you in that video.